Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. So thanks for joining me for part one here of our treatment of alcohol withdrawal disorder. And this part one is on the pathophysiology. However, I'm gonna present the topic of pathophysiology from an extremely simplified perspective of only focusing on four major aspects of the pathophysiology. And the reason why I'm only gonna limit it to the four aspects as such is because those aspects have the highest clinical relevance. And so to that end, let's jump straight into it. However, before I get to the first topic of pathophysiology, I wanted to show this slide here to emphasize why we as healthcare providers should want to understand this disease state as much as possible. And that is because of its huge prevalence in our society. So at the time of this talk right now, 17% of men and 8% of women are or will become dependent on alcohol at some point in their life and hence at risk for withdrawal. And unfortunately, the rate of women becoming dependent on alcohol is actually increasing at the time of this talk as well. So to that end, let's jump to the first topic, which is actually two in one. It's the relationship between GABA and NMDA receptors. And so I wanna, present this topic from this perspective, is life is about balance. And our consciousness, our ability to stay awake is no different. We don't want to be so sedated that we can't open our eyes and function. And at the same time too, we don't want to be so hyperactive that we can't focus. And that is really the relationship between GABA and NMDA. And so with GABA receptors, if we hit the GABA receptors or activate the GABA receptors too much, say with excessive drinking, then what happens is, is that it'll cause a depressed mental state. However, it'll cause a depressed mental state at first. But remember that our bodies are constantly adapting to our surroundings and our environment. And so if we continue to drink, our body's gonna do everything it possibly can to try to stay awake. And so on the GABA side, what it's gonna do is, is it's gonna decrease the number of GABA receptors to simply make it harder for that amount of alcohol in our, uh, in our system to cause sedation. However, on the flip side are the NMDA receptors, which are uh, responsible for giving us excitation. And so if we're constantly drinking, and depressing our mood, then what the body's gonna to wanna to do is increase the number of NMDA receptors so that we can be more excited to stay awake. So this particular topic is so important. I wanna just emphasize it again here on this next slide and to be redundant on purpose. And so GABA here is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and GABA and alcohol bind to the same receptors. And again, when alcohol does that to the GABA receptors, you downregulate the receptors. Now, this is going to be important to, uh, to understand because when we transition to medications, such as say maybe the differences between benzodiazepines and maybe barbiturates, and so say lorazepam and phenobarbital, is that your benzodiazepines for the most part need GABA around to be able to open up the, uh, the GABA receptors. And so that is a limitation considering there are very limited numbers of GABA receptors. However, something like the barbiturates, phenobarbital, can directly open up the GABA receptor without the need for GABA being around. So there'll be a first advantage there to that particular medication. Now, on the NMDA side, it's important to note here that glutamate is an excitatory neural transmitter and it normally binds to NMDA. But 
Alcohol binds to certain receptors to produce sedating effects and long-term use causes an increase in NMDA receptors for what we mentioned, right? Because the body wants to adapt. But here then you have a problem because all of a sudden, if you have a huge increase in the number of NMDA receptors from chronic alcoholism and you stop drinking, what happens then is that glutamate can uninhibited interact with the NMDA receptors and that's when you get that hyperexcited state. That's when you are at most risk of things like delirium, hallucinations, and seizures. And that's going to be important when we talk about certain medications um, that we might want to consider using in the uh, patient who is severely withdrawing from alcohol, say possibly ketamine. So the other two uh, points are going to be in reference to the sympathetic nervous system and then what happens to your circadian rhythms and melatonin. So let's take the first one here. The first one is, is your general dramatic increase in your sympathetic state, which is uh, caused by an increase in norepinephrine. And so this is going to give you that physical shaking, anxiety, agitation, tremor, et cetera. And this, of course, in modern treatment of alcohol uh, withdrawal is where we think about things such as clonidine or Presidex or 10X, which is another medication that I'll introduce to you um, uh, in the next slide. However, at this particular point here, I just want to have a little bit of caution in that we know that you're going to have an increased hypersympathetic state, and that's very uncomfortable for a patient. And treating with Presidex, say, helps them to be more comfortable. But the Presidex is not going to interact with the NMDA receptors in the brain. And so it's important to keep in mind that though the patient physically might appear more relaxed, they could still be predisposed to seizures. And we, of course, need to ask in their history, have they had seizures uh, before? Because those are particularly the patient that could be uh, most at risk for having a recurrent seizure. Um, and we could, again, mask uh, our ability to pick that up to a certain degree by only treating, say, with an alpha-2 inhibitor um, such as Presidex. However, the other thing that happens in these patients is that they just dramatically um, uh, imbalance their circadian rhythms, um, and they have a huge decrease in melatonin. And one of the things that we really want to do for these patients to help break the cycle of their withdrawal is get them back into normal circadian rhythms, and supplementing with something like melatonin is going to be really important to achieve that aim. So that's it for this topic. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in part two when we talk about the medications. Thank you. For more information, please visit our website at www.med-specialists.net. You can also find us on YouTube as Medical Specialists Associates. Thanks for listening.